so warm and I won't bite me. hard afraid you can All right. Let me ask you a question and be honest. Oh! Do I make you horny? Randy? Do I make you horny, baby? Yeah, do I? Come on, I hope this is part of the unfreezing process. Oh, look at that. Oh, Oh, I fell over. Oh, I fell over again. Oh! Mr. Powers! I would never have sex with you, ever. If you were the last man on Earth and I was the last woman on Earth, and the future of the human race depended on our having sex simply for procreation, I still would not have sex with you. What's your point, Vanessa? Filmmaker. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jay, you're here, you're here. This movie is so hilarious. It's pretty weird watching it. I've never seen it projected uh, since 1997, so that was pretty. I only saw the end, but it was, it was kind of cool to watch it. It's, it. There's some some stuff that plays better than other uh, sort of semi-dated jokes, but it was always meant to be um, something that you would turn on, and we actually planned it this way that where you wouldn't know what era it was made if you didn't know anything about it. And that time we thought it would just be a cult film. You might. We never used real opticals. We never used steady cams. We, ne we, would, we deliberately try to make it look like an old movie. So right. um, some of it's kind of deliberately dated. Yeah. When they say James Bond, but I also saw a lot of Peter Sellers in it, you know. Yeah, we, um, you know, we had a lot of influences. That was one of the things to try to avoid just being a parody movie, you know. Um, some, are you guys warm? Is it? Yeah, warm? it's a little warm. Um, uh, so we wanted it to seem like it was sort of um, derived from a lot of different influences. Well, the way I got the job, because I didn't really have much experience when I uh, kind of auditioned Thank for the you, job. Thank you, you're answering my yeah, first well, question I that I haven't even it, asked yet. It, but it was about those sources, because I didn't, I didn't really have a reel or anything to show, but I cut together some clips from movies that I had been aware of that were sort of off-center blow up, you know, which we ripped off heavily at the end with all the... Exactly. The, uh, the photographing, but um, also uh, a movie called uh, The Tenth Victim with Marcello Mastroianni and uh, Ursula Andress. Uh, it was kind of a trippy uh, sort of uh, um, th pop art thriller or something. And, uh, and another heist what film. What is it called? I can't uh, believe the Tenth I Victim. It. Really? Okay. It's actually, you will see, Ursula Andress does a, a little strip tease with the, the guns that <laughs> pop out of her bra, which we. <laughs> We didn't want it to seem like, uh, I like those kind of films that are deliberately parody films, but we th hoped it would seem like, as I say, it was something else and you couldn't quite trace all the DNA of it. So we, <laughs> we, um, we used films like that and I showed those clips in a big meeting uh, and said, I don't have anything to show. And they kind of said, who are you? We're not just gonna no. hire Mike's buddy. I know. And I said, I totally hear you and here's, uh, here's some, Here's, I don't have anything to show to prove that I can do it, but I, here's some films I like. <laughs> and they, and they, they hired me based on liking the same films to some extent. Yeah, because I knew the Todd sisters at the time. Yeah. And, you know, first it was excitement. Okay, we set it up in uh, New Line. And then they said, well, you know, they don't want a first-time director. And yeah. So I always wanted to ask you, and it's yeah. one of the reasons even that I did Austin Power rather than Meet the Parent or something, because that leap... It was you know, for the leap. student, it's yeah. interesting to know it was a leap. how Although you get... I, I had 10 years to get ready for the leap, because uh, <laughs> I graduated in 86 um, from USC Film School, a graduate, graduate student, and um, I had done a few things. I'd written a little bit, and I'd shot some second unit on some campy sci-fi things and stuff, and uh, <laughs> uh, I had done a very bizarre, It's a, if, forgive me if you've heard this story, but it's kind of interesting. Mike. Myers, I knew him indirectly through our wives, kind of knew each other. I had uh, done some work on a, uh, a very bizarre, sort of psychological, almost David Lynch style thriller 
not thr well, thrillers are not even more sounds is more interesting than the film really was because it wasn't that thrilling. But it was about <laughs> Adolf Hitler and the psychology of evil, as if you trap as if, as if the concept was as if Hitler was trapped in a bunker after the war. He'd faked his suicide and still alive and was revisiting his. <laughs> it was the most ridiculous film of all time. And um, Mike saw that and said, "Oh, you should do Austin Powers." So that's and that's from what, true because he was a. Uh, he was a World War II history um, buff. His parents were in the uh, in the service in England, and he's an ang Anglophile. Yes. And uh, you know, so he we had things in common. They just weren't you know James Bond derived uh, comedies. But uh, it was a pretty big leap. And he just kept saying to them, you know what? After a while, they they kept saying no. And he said, just I'm not going to do it unless. This guy, I think he is the guy, and he took a. He is really the one who took the crazy leap. Then the studio with Mike DeLuca in charge and the Todd sisters who, yeah. who produced uh, went along with that risk. But Mike really staked everything, and he wasn't in a really in a position of power to do that at the time. He'd, he'd had success, but there were some films that didn't hadn't worked. Yes. The sequel to Wayne's World, right. I Married an Axe Murderer, which were I thought really funny, but hadn't put him in a position of yeah. demanding who right. his director would be. So, anyway, but he still did amazing. Yeah. So that's how it happened. <laughs> wow. Now, I know Jay for a while, okay? You look at him. He's made some of the funniest movies. <laughs> Thank you. And I, every time I laugh, I say, but where did it come from? Because you're not the kind of guy yeah. that goes saying? and cracks jokes and people are saying, yeah. well, that guy is really, really funny. Yeah, I don't. It's, <laughs> I, um, Thank you. <laughs> um, I didn't really no, look uh, at him. set he's out like to do. He's like modest and well, he's like serious. I, just, I didn't set out to do comedy. It's true, and um, I loved, you know, Monty Python and I, Woody Allen. But I had more taste for David Lynch movies and Kurosawa movies. And right. I don't know a bunch of uh, you know I don't know uh, some some comedies that I liked uh, Hal Ashby movies and The Graduate I mean typical yeah. things that people quote nowadays were ex exactly what I kind of developed my taste in movies on but it was Mike once Mike started, said make this movie I I went in an audition for I got it and then once this happened it, it wasn't that big of a hit I appreciated you saying that but it wasn't. Uh, it, it 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 never previewed well we pre we did some previews in this very room. People didn't get it at first. It, it came out as a modest hit that summer, and uh, it could have just ended there. If Mike DeLuca had not been so brave, he, we, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the preview process, but you, you invite people to rooms like this, sometimes this small, sometimes a lot bigger, in malls. They come and watch the film, fill out cards, and do a focus group. And you want to hit in a mainstream comedy at least in the 80s you know or low 90s <laughs> right. to to guarantee to get a sense that your film will be successful in the scoring process uh, and we never got above 55 we started at a 48 and we worked our way up to oh, 55 oh <laughs> my god and um, after three or four score previews and deluca said you know what i i know it's not not everyone's going to get this, and we'll just put extra money in the marketing to kind of find the audience that will get it, and we'll take a shot. But most comedies, there are many director careers that would have been stopped totally. in their tracks after the first film. And uh, then it did become an acquired taste, and people, because it is weird. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of can't, can't be in a certain way. Camp isn't that successful in America usually. It's that. You know, Mike's looking right into the camera, making muggy jokes. You know, kind of a Benny Hill style. Yeah, <laughs> and that's not that doesn't usually work for American yeah. audiences. So we didn't expect it to work. Honestly, we just made it because we love those films, uh, especially our Richard Lester movies. You know, right. uh, not of just course. Hard Day's Night uh, and Help, which we ripped off at the beginning, but The Knack and a bunch of other uh, Richard Lester films. Yeah, just not mainstream. And then the video took off in some weird way. And then Mike did this trailer for the second movie uh, where he pretended to be sort of a Darth Vader kind of breathing. Because <laughs> we, we Star Wars was coming out that summer. And uh, he, we did this long push into the back of the chair on the spaceship. And he turned around. And it's him. And he said, oh, expecting someone else? you know. And he has the cat. And it's Dr. Evil. And he says, if you see 
one movie this summer, see Star Wars. But if you see two movies, see Austin Powers. <laughs> and it exploded. It was I like know. a crazy phenomenon. It. That one crazy uh, teaser. It wasn't even a full trailer. It was uh, months before the movie came out. And, and that, uh, that um, sort of fanned the video sales on the first one. And then by the time the second, came, second one came out, everybody was, uh, was you know, it was, a, it was fun. The midnight shows and the whole deal was really a, a blast. But it was not predictable <laughs> in any way. So I, once I was on that sort of, in that club, and the, the, yes. the uh, comedy, comedy director club yes. is small, and I didn't know, I honestly was kind of naive about it. Um, you know, you take your first film for scale, and you just, you're so, <laughs> I was so lucky to even get a break. And Mike and I, you know, worked so closely together, and I, I was like on the job training for me, because he knew so much about comedy. He actually has a system in his mind, uh, you know, having done SNL, uh, Saturday Night, I mean, yeah. uh, Saturday Night Live, but also um, Second City, and uh, worked with Del Close in improv training, Lauren Michaels in SNL. I mean, he just has an encyclopedic uh, brain about comedy. He could right. give a master course, you know, that would blow your mind and why certain things are funny and why things that you think would be funny are yeah. not, you know? And he, I learned while I was doing it. So then once you get in the club, I started realizing, wow, this, this is actually a good club to be in. Because they, <laughs> they, if you've yes. done it once or twice, they, they keep they calling you back. They want you. And uh, <laughs> it was, that was thrilling. It was really cool. Yeah. Oh. My wife gets a huge amount of credit, who you know really well, Susanna Hoffs. She's the, From the Bangles, guys. Remember yeah. the Bangles? Yeah. She's in Ming T, the band that plays, um, you know, in the, in the sequence breaks, and she's in, she sings the BBC One song at the end with, with Mike and Matthew Sweet's in it too. But she actually was, as she, she got the film even before I did. And so you have, you know, I was like, I'm not sure. And she was like, Are you freaking crazy? I'll kill you if you don't direct this movie. And, um, and then she uh, she helped with the music, uh, choosing music, and coming. she was a big influence in the whole thing too. His wife, by the way, always says that when she met him, she was a, actually a big star uh, singer, and, and he, I, was a, I was a professor at the time. You were a professor. She said was, yeah. basically you slept in the car. That's how poor you were, or something. <laughs> I was I wasn't that poor, but I was I didn't. I had a motor. I didn't have a car. I, w I had a motorcycle. And she uh, was okay. A, but since he graduated Stanford, she knew that he has prospects. It was the only time in my entire <laughs> career that mattered. So. <laughs> no one's ever asked to see my degree. I promise. You. So so um, when you did this movie. And it was a success, the Austin Power. Then you go and you do Meet the Parents, and suddenly you're working with Ben Stiller and mm -hmm. Robert De Niro. Did you feel more confident, or were you still kind of a fan, nervous? Well, confidence, I never, in comedy, confidence almost, at least for me, doesn't exist. You, you're always insecure. It's why most people in comedy are right. pretty crazy <laughs> and pretty neurotic, because you, it just never feels funny enough. So you, um, and with, in, unfortunately, in most of the films I've been involved with on the comedy side, the scripts never come together entirely, and you have to start shooting before right. you have the ending, and right. so you're kind of writing every night, and I don't know, I've, <laughs> I've it's not, my mental health traced through uh, my comedy films, they're really deep dips <laughs> every time, especially in prep. So, um, and De Niro scared the hell out of me and scared the hell out of, you know, Ben Stiller too, which I saw in the, in the dinner and said, oh, this is going to work, you know, because he was intimidated. <laughs> and then, uh, then we did the sequel to Meet the Parents and then it was Dustin Hoffman, Barbara Streisand, and we, we didn't want to make a sequel unless we brought something new, yeah. but I was like, this is what we're going to do. I, I felt like it was, it was suicidal. Yeah. And, they were known at the time as being kind of tricky people to yes. harness, you know, yes. get to, and they, they, I, I was stressed going in, and actually got, I, had to, I got sick a couple, a couple weeks in because I hadn't slept for like months, and uh, worrying. They shut down, and they like, I, and then I, I, you know, had a weird childhood virus or something that was s s triggered by just total stress, <laughs> and um, I came back, and and they were sweet as pie. They were great, you know, and and most of the people who once they get performing for each other. One secret in comedy is just cast only funny people, the funniest, especially in improv, right. so that they always are 
playing with each other, and yes. then you can kind of just, <laughs> you know, sort of set the table. Yeah. And a lot of the comedy is around tables <laughs> in those movies, and just kind of get out of the way. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to open up to the students to ask some questions, because this is for them. Don't be shy. There's always at the beginning, yep. it's like they're nervous, <laughs> they're, nobody wants to be the first. Right? All right, go over there. This way. Oh, yeah, that'll make you feel like <laughs> breaking the ice. <laughs> go right to the mic. Hey, you know what? They have to learn to be in front of audience. You know, I, that's why I taught. I was so I was such a terrible stage fright person that I used teaching to convince myself that I could direct. Hi. Hello. Um, is it on? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, okay, so I was wondering what um, would you say is the most uh, when you did Hitchhiker's Guide. Mm -hmm. What do you, what would you say is the most um, important thing that set it apart? from all the other movies that you've done in a uh, sci-fi aspect? Well, I didn't direct Hitchhikers, um, but the most amazing thing about nearly directing and then ending up producing it uh, was working with Douglas Adams, because he, uh, he saw Austin 1 and uh, had been trying for years to come up with screenplays for Hitchhikers, and um, uh, a guy named Michael Nesmith from the Monkees introduced us, and uh, you know, and it was an amazing, an unbelievably transcendent experience working with him. He's one of the funniest people I'd ever met, and uh, just you know, a brainiac. And it was sort of like he's he's very similar to John Cleese in my mind, and how he looks at life and approaches life. And I was such a, a Python fan that um, anyway, so. I worked with him for quite a while, and then he uh, he he sort of struggled. Disney didn't get it. Um, Disney had a very very mainstream kind of set of executives at the time. I I, I never figured out why they even bought it, uh, and he died. He died, you know, having moved here, ready to do it, and it was very sad. Uh, and um, I just couldn't face doing it without him. So I talked uh, two guys that I met, um, Garth Jennings and. Uh, Nick, um, it's basically Nick's last name, but the producer partner of, of Garth, and they uh, they they came up with a really actually kind of a, a novel twist on it, and invented a lot of new things on top of Douglas's Douglas's script. So it was uh, that was uh, that was a, that was actually a tricky one. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. What's up, Jay? Hey, <laughs> how's it going? <laughs> Um, first off, thank you very much for coming and talking to us today. It's really it's great. Fun. I it's wanted to ask you, I guess it's the million dollar question, I guess any words of wisdom you would give uh, to students, film students, as soon as we graduate, what the best next step would be if you wanted to be a producer director? Um, yeah, I do, you know, it is a, a question and it's the question I had, you know, that took me 10 years to answer, so uh, <laughs> no, not to be discouraging. Um, it, it still will work out, but it might take a while. Um, you know, I did, I did so many different things to uh, kind of weasel my way in, including, you know, getting a job based on other people's, you know, clips from other people's <laughs> movies. Um, but I, um, I, one of the things that I find uh, has been, has not only worked for me, but worked for many other people that I've, that have worked for me since, since I uh, came up was that the, the notion of getting work not in the typical way like becoming a PA or a, you know, a camera assistant or a, you know, a producing assistant or something that's on the set in the middle of... The, to me, the very best gig you can get out of film school is as a writing assistant. And that's what, I, in addition to teaching when I first came out and, and I was also shooting as a cameraman for a while and a, a lot of low budget stuff, I got a gig uh, from an old friend uh, being a writing assistant um, for a guy named Penn Densham who wrote uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and uh, right. some, you know, they produced Backdraft and uh, um, a film which I wrote the story for called Blown Away, I co-wrote the story for, and a few other things that they were, they were kind of, uh, you know, very much in the zone, and I was in their writing rooms just taking notes. I taught myself to type really fast, and I it just, became a stenographer, but beyond that, I would help them organize the notes into uh, you know, manageable, accessible information kind of documents, and even sometimes took a shot and would 
and after a long writing meeting, would organize their, their, the scenes at an outline order and try to present back to them, I, here's what I think you guys have in mind. And eventually they said, wow, you're kind of helping us write this. Why don't you write a couple of these scenes? I wrote some stuff without credit. Uh, they never, they couldn't really pay me for this. So I said, well, let me operate camera on the second unit and I would get operating jobs that way. And then I, they, one of them got really busy, Penn got busy and got a gig doing a sci-fi television show. And I, he said, why don't you write the pilot? Uh, I have a story, you write the pilot. So I wrote a pilot, it got picked up, uh, made into a pilot, and then got picked up as a series. It did not turn out to be a good series and didn't, uh, didn't last very long. But again, out of that, I got to direct second unit and um, I directed, which is good training of, you know, on that and another TV movie called Life Pod, which was a remake of Hitchcock's Life Boat set in space. I got to direct <laughs> scenes that the directors didn't want to deal with, including a whole sequence dealing with this one little, little person guy that uh, I got to direct this, an actor, you know, who was about four feet tall, but he, you know, it was my first shot at directing actors. And anyway, so through the writing assistant job, and I've hired since then a ton of writing assistants of my own. Um, Shauna Robertson, uh, who became Judd's, Judd Apatow's main producer, did 40 Year Old Virgin and a right. slew of his films. Um, uh, Larry Stuckey, who's now become my writing partner. Uh, Michael McCullers was our writing assistant on the first Austin Powers, became, wrote the sequels for the second two, just from being in those rooms. Wow where you're in touch with every decision that goes into getting the film created and made uh, as the most enjoyable one versions of that are when people have no idea what they're going to do and you're really starting from scratch and they're just sitting around a room and saying, well, what if they did this? Um, the writing assistants for uh, Sasha's process have all gotten work and it's, it's, it's an incredibly good way. You're involved in casting, you're involved in the studio bullshit, you know, the, all the politics. You hear everything in that room because while you're writing, you're also of juggling. Most of these people are writer producers, so they're trying to sort of stitch the whole thing together. You, you get kept around during, on comedies, the writing goes through the shoot, it goes through post production. So you're kept involved through the shoot, and you do get to sh end up on the set, but you're also the person up late at night, you know, uh, after everyone else has gone to bed, trying to make sense of the notes that came up in that rehearsal that day. You sit in rehearsals, you actually get to see the, the directors directing the actors because you're improving in the rehearsals and turning that into script pages. So it's just a pitch to, and, and you only, as a, as a writer producer, I would only hire the smartest people, young people, who could, if they, were given a shot, probably do better at writing. I would always hire people I thought were smarter than us, you know, just get, and it is, at, we've hired a lot of USC people, a lot of AFI people, Stanford people. I've started helping the Stanford uh, get their screenwriting program together because I went there as an undergrad, and, as you mentioned. And so anyone who's, you know, who, who can get a hold of, of working writers and, uh, and get that gig, and I think that's the best possible shot. Wow. That's it? Yep, that's it. <laughs> and then, you know, meanwhile, write. The other big one is write yourself all the time. Don't do, like, just write scripts and shoot. Now you have a, I didn't have the opportunities you guys have of getting things seen. A two minute comedy short can be seen by millions of people if it's good now by just, you know, bumping it up on YouTube and shoot and write just every second. Try to avoid the kind of, Slightly, I think, can be dead end jobs like PAing, and well, I'm sure this is sacrilegious because a lot of people come up from PA too. But it's just I know so many people who went that production route, and and uh, you kind of you if you want to be a first AD or a line producer, PAing is great. If you want to write and produce, just working as a writing assistant in the daytime and at night, write your own movies, and on the weekends, shoot your movies with all your friends, and that's. You, I, I can't, if you have any talent at all within a couple of years, someone will figure out you have it and we'll give you a gig. Thank you very much. I also, just not that big of a line, but I just had one other quick question. Sure. Uh, for the campaign, uh, Zach Galifianakis, I guess previously before the movie, I guess was written, had a, a side character where he played his, played Seth, his brother, Seth, Seth Galifianakis. Yeah, that's, that is his character, Marty Huggins, was yeah. derived from Seth. That's correct. He was the uh, slightly effeminate, uh, you know, not he plays the, his twin, kind of evil twin brother who hates him, hates Zach, and uh, is always dishing on him. 
in those comedy shorts that he used to do before he did that character, yeah. Well, it was a great movie, so Thanks. thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, thank you. Hi, thank you so very much for coming thank again, you. and not just very for this movie, but I think that comedies are way more important than many people think, because <laughs> we laugh, we live longer and happier, so I really do thank you for that, for all those wonderful, oh, thanks, man. funny, that's, funny, that's cool. thanks. funny films that you've done. And my question would be, how do you pitch a comedy? Because we all do a lot of pitching all the time. Mm -hmm. Is there anything special, like any comedic twist that, that, that works? That's, a, good, that's a really good question. Uh, we've done it a lot of different ways. We sold, uh, the campaign is an interesting story because we sold it on a pitch uh, here at Warner Brothers. Um, and because it was myself, Zach, and Will who had come to me and asked me to do it, Adam McKay, who's the third, uh, you know, the second partner under Will and Funny or Die and Chris yeah. Henshee, the third partner, all of us were in the room um, pitching a story and we only had about three paragraphs. <laughs> and we told all the studios, um, we want to, to make this film in about six months and we want you to green light it in the room right. or don't take the pitch. Yes. <laughs> so we got all of their, it was very arrogant to do this, but um, we got them all to, each of the studios that were interested to put their, not only their head of the studio and, and their creative executives, but the head of marketing, uh, both domestic and international, head of publicity, domestic, international, head of physical production. Oh my so God. we had like 12, the quote unquote green light committee yeah. that studios now have in the actual room listening to the pitch. And, um, and we didn't have the actors, so uh, my, uh, Adam McKay, Chris Henchy, and myself had to sort of act out you know, the parts and how they would go, um, and we're not good at that. <laughs> so um, we, had to, we just had to have a hook, you know, and it was an example of where, okay, it's, it's two political candidates in the South, uh, a, a kind of loser, uh, slacker incumbent who's just coasting along, and an upstart played by Zach, and, and they could picture that character we were talking about uh, doing this slightly effeminate uh, southern conservative, uh, and they're just going to smear the crap out of each other in a, in a <laughs> relentless battle of negative campaigning <laughs> until one of them dies, you know, basically. Uh, Zach and Will, two of the funniest guys on earth, what do you think? And that was the pitch. <laughs> but it was, it, it actually did, you could kind of picture what the movie became off of that pitch. It was a stupid way to from, from, from a directing standpoint to ever get into it because you think, oh good, we've got them hooked and we're committed and we have a shoot date and a release date by three or four days later. And then you go, oh no, we don't have a script. <laughs> <laughs> and we, it was, oh, it was so excruciating. Again, I, I swore I would never do that. But if you, um, if you, you know, if you have a, what I call a controlling idea of, in your own mind of what, what is the hook and in Meet the Parents, you know, I talk about it because that one, we had a little more of a script, but it was touch and go almost every day there was a threat to shut it down. Really? Uh, for different reasons, budget reasons, uh, right. to, you know, actor reasons. And for me, it was so easy to say, don't know, yeah, but don't forget, it's a guy who loves a girl so much and is sure he doesn't rate, he doesn't, he doesn't deserve her, but is going to overcompensate and try so hard to get her that he's just going to make it worse by sneaking and lying <laughs> and becoming exactly the person n no parent would want to have be engaged to your daughter. And the person he's going to come up against is a human lie detector, a person who is a bullshit detector meets a bullshitter. How can, you, how can that not work? If it's Ben Stiller and he's you know, the, the world's most interesting <coughs> bullshitter and Robert De Niro who <laughs> is a, an assassin, a killer, dressed in soft sweaters and a, and a little cat and a waspy wife and will, <laughs> you know, garret you in your sleep. That's like, that sounds funny. So that's how you, if I, if I know I can tell that story because as a director you become the sort of high priest of the religion, the, the cult leader of the, of the faith and whatever you're doing, if you can tell it with that much enthusiasm to not just the studio, but to the, to the DP who's trying to convince you, you know, to shoot it this way, and you don't want to shoot it that way, and here's why, because <laughs> this idea depends on this tour, or the costume designer trying to sell you, right. you know, you, you have to, you just have to keep organizing it back to that one controlling idea. And if the pitch is strong in the room when you first set it up, you can keep pitching it to everybody who threatens that pitch, all, threatens that concept all along the way until it, you know, it sort of survives <laughs> somehow and, 
and turns into a movie. So that's my. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. Successful pitch. I, uh, that's my... Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my question is about one of my favorite films, Borat. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about you know the difficulties in producing that, which I guess were many. Um, How did it come to you? Yeah, um, Jimmy Miller, uh, my manager. Directors don't usually have managers, but I, because my agent when I started wasn't a comedy guy, I, I wasn't seen as a comedy guy. So you should get a comedy guy on your team, and I got Jimmy, who was at the time was famous for being Jim Carrey's agent and Will yeah. Ferrell's agent uh, manager. Excuse me. Sasha Baron Cohen signed with Jimmy, and Jimmy, and he wasn't that well known here. He had done, he was doing Ali G and had done the Ali G show both in England and in, uh, on HBO, and it was a modest hit in, in, yeah. at midnight. You know, it was late. Yeah. It was on late. I saw it, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and he had tried to do, a, he had done an Ali G scripted movie in England that didn't even get released here because it didn't quite work. And, um, Ali G it was called. Yeah, Ali G. And, uh, so he, um, he, you should see, if you haven't seen the Ali G yeah, show, oh my God, it's like one of the greatest comedy on television ever <laughs> made. Um, he plays, because he plays all three characters, uh, Ali G, Borat, and Bruno in the TV show. And anyway, so I met with him and we just started, he, he, Jimmy thought I would have a, I would be able to help Sasha get the story, that it wouldn't right. survive as a skit-based thing yes. unless it had a story. Yeah. And that's what we did. And we, uh, we started with, it was hard to get a story, and actually Trey Parker and Matt Stone worked with us for months on a, a more scripted version, which was one of the most hilarious, crazy, uh, out there stories ever. And they wrote a whole script, um, but it was so scripted that it didn't allow Sasha to do his live interaction with real people, and, and uh, they couldn't kind of follow through with it because they, then they went off to do Team America. So then we went back and started over with Sasha and all his writers um, and got Larry Charles, or first we got Todd Phillips to direct and they worked together and then Todd and Sasha, that, as a producer that was the hardest time because they, didn't, they were perfect for each other on paper because Todd had done documentaries right. and comedy right. and Sasha and him seemed to get along but they just didn't uh, sync up um, chem chemically <laughs> speaking uh, at the beginning and uh, they, that fell apart two weeks in so we shut down for four months and we went and got Larry Charles and went back into it. And we painted out Todd, who had who'd been cast as the Azimat character, the uh, producing character. Todd had cast himself as that character, and he was in the shots, like at the rodeo. I don't know, how many of you have seen Borat? Yeah. OK, wow, All that's right. cool. Why don't I, I, I always get the accounting sheets, and it says it's still in the red. <laughs> yes. Um, so, um, <laughs> no, Borat actually did well, but Austin Powers one is still, this movie, that one you just saw, is still listed as a, we paid, we only made, it cost $16 million, and it's still in the red somehow. I know, um, I have one at Paramount. Yeah. Yeah, Varsity um, Blues. But, uh, so you, you saw the rodeo scene, and, um, Todd was in some of that footage, and, and we painted him out and made it look like it was Azimat there. Anyway, so that's the only scene that survived that version. Um, <laughs> the trickiest part I, about that movie was, for me, was getting used to being sued. <laughs> I, <laughs> I got sued 15 times, I think, or something. Personally, my name. Wow. You, are, you are now being sued for millions of dollars because you have invaded my privacy. Yeah, uh, we did invade your privacy, um, but we think we had a right to. And um, that, that uh, we won all the cases. The, the studio, we weren't um, at risk ourselves because they always indemnify you. Yeah. They, they uh, basically get insurance. Uh, I don't know how you, I don't, he must be impossible to insure now based on how many types of suits. Because yes. even if you win the suits, the legal expenses are high. Um, but his and may I ask you, sure. um, you won on the basis of? His, he'd been doing it for 10 years, and his releases, if I come to you and I say, I'm doing this movie with this, this uh, Kazakhi reporter, don't worry, he's, a, he's just a representative of the youth of Kazakhstan, and he's come to America to figure it out, you would say, oh, okay, uh, that sounds good. So uh, you, you would sign it and read probably the first three pages. Well, on yes. page 56 at the bottom, <laughs> it will say, um, by signing this, you ag agree that we can use your likeness even if the Kazakh journalist turns out not to be a Kazakh journalist, and even <laughs> if the movie turns out not to be a documentary, and even if, and like, it's like, it basically outlines everything he's gonna do, and 
you agree to it without realizing that you are signing off to be in Borat, the comedy <laughs> movie, not the, the Borat, the Kazakh. Uh, God, I'm borrowing that yeah. contract. Is it online? Oh, no, it's, Can I, I get there have been, the, the lawyers now do seminars based on that contract. Wow. Because, uh, and the crazy thing, which we got, even people who didn't sign it sued us. People who would wander, like, he's in New York City, he's wandering, he I'm Borat, I want to kiss you, and he would try to kiss, and he, he went after this one guy who was like a Wall Street executive or something, and the guy freaked out and, like, was chased down the road, and just, Borat's chasing him, I want to kiss you, you know, and that poor guy w didn't sign anything, didn't see the posters that say, if you stand around in this area, you could be filmed, and by doing so, you automatically waive your rights to privacy. He didn't see those and still lost the lawsuit because the judge said wow. what he's doing, what Sasha's doing, which is true, uh, is in the public good because it's exposing racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, right. and the public good uh, of the film overrides. overrides your individual right to privacy at that moment. Oh my God. So be careful. It's, uh, <laughs> you see anybody who's got a slightly strange looking beard or uh, <laughs> wants you to But I interrupted you, I'm sorry. No, you okay. were talking about something. I don't, uh, uh, I just that, that the hardest part was dealing with the, the constant chaos of th threats and, and suits. And um, I will say the funniest I've never seen an audience um, react to anything like the way they reacted to one scene in that movie, which was the naked fight. <laughs> we, I've sat in audiences all over the world, and we, the one cool thing we, that I got to do in that movie, I didn't direct the film, but I directed all of the publicity stunts after the movie, when he was in the green thong on the beach, yes. and, and <laughs> when he, uh, went, we went to the White House, and um, he, we found out that the, the um, uh, Prime Minister, I guess, of Kazakhstan was coming to America. <laughs> well, a couple weeks before, he threatened to sue Sasha, right. and that was like, oh, thank you. That's the best thing that could ever happen. <laughs> we got so uh, Sasha in character released, um, I think, a tweet or a thing on Facebook or something. He said, I, I don't know this uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, but I'm glad that you are suing this Jew. <laughs> <laughs> As Borat, and uh, so we went to the Kazakh embassy. He's in character. We found out the, ca the guy was coming over in, in D.C. and was being awarded, being presented with this giant statue on the lawn of the embassy of Kazakhstan on Pennsylvania Avenue, you know, not far from the White House. So we thought, oh, great, there'll be KGB, uh, you know, um, white, uh, Secret Service, local cops. We'll just show up too and see what happens. <laughs> and uh, Sasha, I dressed in a, a suit like a PR guy. He was in a, and then we had a little small army of people. And as as they they unveiled the statue, it was a it was the prime minister himself riding on a tiger carrying a hawk. <laughs> as a, like, that's low profile uh, kind of diplomacy. Thing. And it was giant bronze thing and they went all the NBC they celebrated then they went to lunch where well, all the CNN NBC uh, about two dozen media outlets were there on the risers facing where the podium was and they just were clearing it out and we ran in with the podium dropped it down and Sasha started giving a speech <laughs> my name is Bora I am here to present my movie film to President George Walter Bush and I uh -huh. invite him to see the movie you know and and by the way, we're launching our catapults to those crazy Uzbekis or whatever. Like, he went in this long speech. Well, the embassy people called the cops, um, who now had mostly had gone to lunch following him, and said, there's someone breaking into our embassy. There's someone trying to invade the embassy. So you see the cops in the background of the footage looking at the window saying, "Where?" and he, because here's a politician giving a speech that's supposed to be going on. And they're in the background trying to figure out who's breaking into the embassy. And he just kept going and going, got publicized worldwide of Sasha Baron Cohen in front of the, with the guy with the hawk in the background. And that stuff, I got to direct all that stuff. Well, those, we got to go all over the world presenting the, this the movie. And I have never seen people laugh harder at anything, and I, I can be objective because I didn't direct it, and I didn't, you know, I wasn't even there the day they shot it, because we and we started filming it with um, infrared cameras because we wanted to make um, commercials out of people reacting, and people would not. This is what I always go for in a movie. If I see you and the and it's you're laughing so hard, your back is coming off the chair, 
that's like A plus left. Like I'm like, right. oh, thank you. And then <laughs> when, uh, when the cat pees in the ashes and meet the parents or <laughs> I don't know, a few, a few moments in my career it's happened and you just can't believe you, you, know, you did that, that right. In that, it was so much further past this. People were going, Whoa, oh my God, <laughs> lifting their clothes up. And two people ran down in one screening, uh, ran down to the screen and ran back high-fiving the audience. <laughs> And we're like, it was like a tent revival. It was like people speaking in tongues or something. And it went, and it just keeps topping itself, you know. And you could study that and about and and figure out how to surf laughs. And we, you know, it happens in previews in rooms like this where you sit and try to figure out, okay, we got them laughing harder here. How can we make them laugh harder here and keep going and surf that for? I think that goes on for you know a I know. full two or three minutes. Yeah, and until your sides hurt. I've never seen anything. The biggest challenge in that was just opening it up enough to not lose the next bit because they were not, you know, they were losing right. the dialogue or something. Yeah. The next, it was crazy. Well, oh my God. thank you for going through all of that. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Our pain so was is it your shot? Game. Was it shot like all in one piece, or was it pieces no, they, put it, together? No, that was shot over a few days. That was scripted. You know, that's staged. They had, you know, very really? inappropriate uh, positions they got into. They were, <laughs> There were, Sasha's told a lot of jokes about being under Azamat, uh, uh, I forgot the guy's name, Ken, who knows the guy who plays Azamat's name, Ken something, anyway, um, yeah. being trapped under him and not being able to breathe, and I mean, it was like, it went on for days, it was the, one of the most disgusting shoots of all time. <laughs> um, and the, the only part that was unscripted was they, they run out into the hall, chasing each other, he has the, the fist, the rubber, <laughs> the rubber fist. <laughs> And he's chasing down the hall, and they go into the elevator. My favorite part is in the elevator, because these ladies shriek and run out. And then they're still standing there, and they're, they're looking very guilty. And the door's closed, and, they're, and you're wondering why no one else is in the room. So you're in the elevator. So you're, and then the camera slowly pans over, and there's this guy, just a civilian, just trapped there. And he was not, he was, he was not an actor, and just was like, what the hell is going on? And the door opens, they run out, and then they run into um, this um, this um, convention center, uh, what do you call it, banquet style meeting room in a hotel filled with mortgage bankers who really were real mortgage bankers. And they, <laughs> they just run into the room and start fighting on stage naked. And um, <laughs> that was the only time in the entire process. I've only, in making two movies with Sasha, he only broke character once in the middle of shooting. After He, he can be in character for nine hours. I mean, it's so much harder than normal acting because we can right. edit his performance, but on the set, if someone catches him out of character, we shut down that second because the gig's yeah. up. You, people know, but for so hours and hours and hours at a time, he can convince people that through his acting that he's this crazy Kazakh. That day, he broke character and said, "Don't hurt Azamat. Don't hurt him." You know, because <laughs> the security guy was choking him, was so pissed off that he was gonna. So oh. that was real. That part oh, was real. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, just wanted to thank you for uh, your transitions. I think I believe that they're uh, like truly spectacular. Oh wow! Well, thanks. Um, my this my is only good. question is, uh, you you went from a movie Austin Powers where the main actor fought for you to be a part of the project, yeah. where you got to work with your wife and everything. Um, how did that go from working with people who want to work with you to working with some Robert De Niro who can literally fight you? How <laughs> did you deal with that? Um, there, were, I did start to develop a kind of reputation for um, working with people who hadn't been known as being tricky to work with. I mean, I'm not saying anything that's not publicly known, that they okay. were known as it, but they often were so cool when, when I, and Bob was, Bob was ch challenging for me only because I was projecting onto him the killer guy. He actually turned out to be an incredibly uh, generous and, and cool guy. Never, I always tried to keep Ben and him at each other's throats if I could by, by Ben would say, how was that take? I was like, yeah, you know, it's good. He goes, did Bob, what did Bob think? I go, yeah, he thought it was good. He thought it was good. You know, he tried to just get in his head. And, just, he, I want him to be intimidated by him, but it didn't last long because Bob is really cool. And right. he's very, and he was even cooler on the second film because he had Streisand and, and Hoffman and yeah. uh, all these people and they, none of them wanted to disappoint each other. So they were often just performing for each other, and um, I worked with you know people who'd been f famous for having tricky moments on the set. Russell Crowe, um, 
you know, uh, and it was just, yeah. but they, it's a lot of it's um, case specific, you know, situational, and our situations turned out to be fun for them. No, I was going to ask you who was more difficult, Mike Myers or Ben Stiller? <laughs> you know, they, in my situation, they were, they were great collaborators, and I, and I actually got to ride on their coattails, you know, they're, they could, Mike hasn't directed, but he could, and Ben has directed many yeah. times, so to have a, a star who's capable of solving comedy problems with you, uh, you know, as almost like a fellow director in that moment is brilliant. So I, I, um, I've actually had a blast with those guys, and, and still are close friends, I'm doing a thing with Ben uh, at the Tribeca Film Festival, a Q&A like this. Um, Will Bob be there? Yeah, in, uh, on the 21st in uh, Tribeca. Exciting. Well, thank you. Sure, sure. Well, no, it has to do something with your character because I have been on a set. I did a movie with, let's say, Henry Winkler was the director and mm -hmm. Burt Reynolds was the actor, but Burt thought he can act, he can direct Directing, better yeah. than Henry. And I had gave Burt was, him really Burt, Burt was in my movie with Russell Crowe. That was a, a one-two punch, yeah. Oh, my God. And so it was tough. Yeah. It was really, really tough. So. It goes to what I was saying before. I'm, I don't have any special, you know, charm. It's, it's more about... My, I do so much homework to convince myself that it's working because I'm so scared it's not. <laughs> that if I can, if I can get over my own fear and terror and anxiety dreams that you know slowly eat away at my <laughs> organs, then I can go on the set and and deal with right. you know. There's nothing Burt Reynolds can do that's scarier than what I've done to myself. So right. I can take him on, and I did. He, Burt and I did argue about things. Um, but uh, it turned into being a productive thing, and it did eat with all those guys. They will push you hard, right. you know. Right. This isn't good enough. Why? What's going on? Why is that idiot standing over there in my eye line? Like, and they're right. They're, it's not good enough until it's good enough, and they won't. None of those people are, are uh, compromising, easygoing people, yeah. and their work shows it. They are, yes. they are excellent, and they demand excellence, and yes. if they know I'm just as scared about re doing something less than excellent as, as uh, you know, as, as they could try to make me, then I, they, I, I'm, ha I'm sort of invincible <laughs> from an ego point of view. I have no ego, yeah. so try to hurt my ego, good luck, you know, because yeah. I, I don't have any. It's not my, I don't have that Well, that's that what it is, because obviously, you know, you, you don't butt head, but you work with them. Yeah. So that's... How you get I only it. got in a screaming match full tilt, and I won't even tell you who it was, with one actor who was one of the per people we're talking about. But it was one day for one, one thing, and I don't yell ever. I, I don't know if I've ever yelled except this one day. And it was that he broke a code in a way for me of messing with another actor and trying to under, you know, like discourage yeah, them, them and convince that actor that they weren't doing as well. And that we, you know, I, I was shaking afterwards, but I went at it, and <laughs> and the person apologized and said, um, you know, it was really, it actually was a moment of transition in the relationship because he knew that I would fight like a right. mofo to, uh, <laughs> if it was for the benefit of the film, for my own ego. Okay, what else you got, you know? But for for if you go against the, what's great about the film, then I, I would definitely get on someone. Excellent. I How always I get emotional for the. <laughs> Yes. Thanks for coming down. Uh, my question has to do with uh, blocking. I want to know if you had any advice on how to keep the blocking fresh in a comedy. Um, that's an interesting question. It's, um, you know, us usually you, in film school, you're taught to kind of work it all out and diagram it, and I did that. And, and in Austin especially, there's many jokes in Austin Powers that are very geometrical, you know, the, for example, blocking his naked bits, both, yeah. both his and Elizabeth's. <laughs> exactly. There's geometry there that, you know, you could, you could uh, chart a NASA launch, you know, ba um, ba with as much time as we spent on lining things up. And, and uh, some of the set pieces in Austin films were so complex that they had to be pre-blocked and pre-visualized. And I, I got those little um, wooden uh, drawing model things with the hinges on them, and I would, you know, I'd sit and just work it out and draw. I, I start with overhead diagrams to kind of pre-imagine just little circles with, with you know, representing people uh, moving around on a on 
various pieces of paper. And then, and then I start to storyboard it with the storyboard artist who I just act out what I see in the frame and how it will evolve. And I storyboard it not for shots, but edit for edit for edit. Like every cut, I'll have a storyboard. But I only do that in the super technical uh, geometrical scenes, mm -hmm. if you will. For everything else, all the performance scenes, you have to you have to trust that when you get there, and and if you've sold what matters in the scene and where the turning points are and what what, that the actors will tell you how to block it. You will say, so here's where we are. Here's what happened just now before you got here. Here's where you're going to go. Here's what matters to you. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what the other actor's thinking about. Let's just read it, and then let's read it again. Now let's start walking around, and they. They're like iron filings around a magnet. You know, the, the, the right blocking emerges because there's a force field in a way that is the right blocking. And then it's up to you to make sure the camera is in the right place. And I, I, I only wish I could do more scenes where I didn't cover so much. That's one of the things I keep trying to work on in my uh, evolution as a director is I prefer long masters that evolve. and. But in comedy, if you don't do oppositional angles, you right. can't cut out the crappy stuff. And there's <laughs> and, and until I get more like Alfred Hitchcock or Clint Eastwood or whoever those guys are who you know can shoot everything they need in eight hours with the exact right of coverage and they, right. they only put in the film what they've shot. In comedy, you just don't know what's going to work, and there's such a high mortality rate. If you don't have the op oppositional angles, you can't extract and or, or expand the scenes so I often stage things on a on a on an axis sometimes one axis sometimes an evolving axis but as soon as the axis as soon as you're shooting four directions instead of two your shoot day is twice as long because it's literally you have to right. light four directions instead of two directions and so you'll see in a lot of the cutting I often set up an axis and stay on one side of it um, so, but I, the main thing is just trust the actors and don't over, over puppeteer them, you know. Um, and and very very often, you know, it all it all it emerges. And I've also write a lot of scenes around tables. I, for some reason, I've shot so many scenes. That <laughs> my best scenes are often at dinner tables or Doctor Evil's table, or because then they, then you don't have to worry about it. You just get funny, funny crap. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a question. Um, as a actor, I mean, when we're on sets, we get really nervous and all that stuff. So, what is your advice for actors on working on sets? Mm -hmm. To stay calm and relaxed, or something. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't. Uh, I, w you know, it's one thing I envy about actors, especially actors who want to direct, because the dire the directors and a the actors I work with who have directed also but also the directors who've acted before they come directors, they have such an advantage over the rest of us because they get to deal with what actors have to face every day. And they also get to work with other directors. I don't get to go and work on sets with the directors. I don't get to you know, accumulate knowledge from, from working with, like Ben Stiller has worked with you know, many great directors, and now he gets to direct. But I, but I, so I, I can only empathize with you as an actor as an, in this sort of imaginary way because I've never acted. Mm -hmm. But I t will tell you that when I'm trying to create an environment for actors to do their very best work, I, I make it into a complete uh, risk-free zone of total play. Like just, it's, we're just going to play. I'm going to have cameras here. I want you to forget about them. I'm going to shoot a lot of different versions. I'm going to try, try I'm going to shout things in the middle of the take, maybe, you know. But if you just trust one thing that I will bring you into the cutting room, which not many directors do this, and let you look at the early cuts of the film. And if you think I've humiliated you or chosen your worst takes or, or put in, you know, stuff that you don't like, you can you can debate me. You can't. You don't get approval, but you can come in and participate in the editing process. So you get to decide if you've taken a crazy risk on the set and done something really bad. You can just put it in a trim bin, and it'll never see the light of day. You know, and and trust that I I know that we're up to the same thing. We're going to make the best film possible, and so that trust calms actors down. That most of their fears are not whether they can do the scene or whether the scene, ma you know, they get this. It's will someone screw up what, what I'm trying to do and for their own agenda, which has nothing to do with, you know, they're just scared of being um, 
What's the right word? Deceived or yeah, deceived, abused, uh, misunderstood. You know, yeah. if, if you if an actor knows you understand them and you share an understanding of what you're both doing, and as you can tell, I talk a lot to you know to get the idea out. So I like to over communicate until they uh, they just have no hesitations or doubts that uh, that they're going to be taken care of and that they that they're surrounded by other actors who feel the same way who will also uh, you know. Um, uh, be supportive, and now, now I only work with actors who are easy and fun. And you know, if you work with Will Ferrell and uh, and um, Steve Carell and Zach Galifianakis, and uh, I mean, it's just a, it's so fun when everyone is loose and brilliant improvisers. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, <laughs> yeah, you work with actors that uh, like are, are are famous for uh, good improvs, like uh, mm -hmm. Dustin Hoffman, and uh, like maybe you can get good improvs from Will Ferrell. And uh, do you stress like the structure? Do you stress like character psychology, or like do you let them like just be? I don't know, like um, say that say that last part. Say the question one more time. Sorry. I'm yeah. Sure uh, do you when you discuss the characters with the actors? Like do you do you do you like uh, stress on, on the psychology of the character? Oh, like I see. The structure? Or like uh, you know, it's different actors come at it a different way. Some actors love to come at it from internal psychological um, turmoil and conflict. You know, it, some stories are about a person overcoming their own demons and, uh, you know, whatever keeps them from realizing their potential. That can be the story. Um, some people like to come at it from the outside. People like people always think we're, people like Robert De Niro are method, and they only come at it from the inside. He's more concerned with how his props are set up, how his what hat he's going to wear. What he finds the character from a very yeah. intense uh, emphasis on the outward presentation of it and the body language and the <clears throat> having studied the way they move and think and, and talk. And that's how he gets to how they think, because he knows he's going to put his own psychology into it, but it's the outward um, specificity of how he's actually more like an English actor, like Michael Caine or Tom Wilkinson or some of those English guys who train from the outside in than yeah. he is from, from the inside out. And, and then other actors I've worked with, like Laura Dern and um, uh, especially Laura, other people uh, come much more like get, they love to get lost in the, who the person is and what they care about, what matters to them. And I like to, you know, different actors come at it a different way and whatever, whatever works, you know, for them. I, I, uh, I'm, I love to talk about it either, either direction. And uh, my main goal is to not talk very much. I try to just have it be so clear by the time they show up, I don't try not to say very much and just let them, okay, let's just try another one. Let's try, try one right. more, see what happens. You know, and I will sometimes give them a small thing if it's way, if, it's, if it might lead a certain direction, but um, I'm inspired by Woody Allen, who I hear never really says anything to the actors. <laughs> <laughs> he gets great performances. Thank you. But what if the actor has a total different interpretation of what well, you're having? Yeah, your well, head? that's a good question, and that happens sometimes. Uh, and again, if you really understand what your central right. thing is, you can you can win the argument. But very often, uh, a third thing comes out of it. I, I really yes. think the dialectic, uh, the, the the clash of ideas generates yeah. some other thing, or at least an improvement of the thing one of you had. And um, I really am wide open to. Uh, to hearing uh, someone say, I just don't think this makes any sense. I mean, I've had multiple times where I've been shooting, and it's, it's terribly stressful, but where the actor has rehearsed a scene, you've even shot a couple of setups, and the actor goes, I don't know what's going on. I, I've lost track of what, and I'll say, okay, let's take a break, everybody, and we'll sit and re-rehearse the scene, which is really terrifying to the studio people because you're just burning right. money, you know, right. just, have a campfire with money right in the middle of the set. <laughs> and that is, there have been times, that's the hardest part about directing is one saying, yes, we got it, move on, which is really hard because you don't know if you have it, you just have to pick. But the other part is saying, we really don't have it and we're now gonna turn around and redo the entire thing and just blow, just erase everything on the on the hard drives because we're done with this version. You know, I'm not, people look at you like, 
I, the, the, the look on the crew and cast face when you make a decision like that, which means they're not going to get lunch or they're not going to go home wow. early that day, it, or you might have lost your mind and the whole film might shut down. That look on their faces is so hard to recover right. <laughs> from. And I've there there are times and it sometimes works out really well. I always tell the story in Austin one when Aust when Doctor Evil's to Scott and was, that whole right. thing happened off camera. Uh, Seth and Mike were just goofing around, and uh, Mike started doing that to Seth. And I was like, oh, no. And Mike goes, what's wrong? So I go, that's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. We have to shoot that now, <laughs> and, which means I have to turn around and reshoot everything you've already done. <laughs> and it would cost a half a day of shooting. Right. And we threw out everything we shot up to that point and, uh, and started over after lunch uh, wow. because that was such a funny, yeah. a funny thing that Seth and Mike had come up with. So that's, wow, that will... That will um, that will get you some doctor appointments later on. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again for coming. Sure. Uh, I was wondering when or if we'll be able to see the next Austin Powers film. Yeah, you know, that's a question I get asked a lot, and uh, it's kind of all up to Mike. You know what I will say is coming uh, to look out for is a musical, a Broadway musical. Um, Based well, on uh, well, you know fun. yeah Austin Powers musical that's it's it's fun. not it hasn't been fully it's been talked about for a long time but I actually think it's kind of close like it could actually happen uh, now wow. and um, I know uh, it's something that everybody involved would like to see happen but I don't know if the it's all up to Mike on the sequels I mean it's sequels are tough and you can definitely do too many and we it's so nice to stop before you do too many <laughs> and uh and i've experienced the other way too um so you you want to um you want to choose carefully that you've earned it that the audience is really genuinely dying for it and that you can actually deliver it and exceed expectations because if you can't exceed expectations not just meet them then you know it's it's not very enjoyable. So it's kind of, but it's he has a good story. We've worked on a story over the years, uh, based on Doctor Evil. Um, uh, you know, centered a little more on Doctor Evil, who's I've always loved that that character really as much as anything. The 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 Doctor Evil, Scott Evil, Mini Me, Frau <laughs> thing is, and you could definitely do a whole spinoff of just them and. Um, um, yeah, so. I just, of course, just noticed that Will Ferrell was like yeah, two seconds in Yeah, that was his first feature film, the guy, Mustafa, who won't die. And he comes back in every film. He actually came back in the third when we cut him out, but he's in the, I think he's in the DVD extras, maybe. No, he actually didn't make it even to the DVD extras, but <laughs> because I felt bad, we would, I thought we'd be exploiting him to stick in. A, he, he played a giant Pokemon. He was inside of a Pokemon <laughs> suit in Japan, and he falls down into a manhole, and... Uh, he, he try to, they try to kill him, and he won't die off camera again. All right, yeah. well, thanks for elaborating on that. Yeah, sorry I can't give you Austin 4 yet. But a stage play, that would be really fun. With I hope it goes, yeah. There have been rumors about it for a long London. time. It's still rumors, don't quote me, but okay. I, I, have, I have higher hopes for that, let's say, than uh, the film sequel. <laughs> So first of all, I want to thank you for spending your time here and for all your words of wisdom so far. I'm sure everybody agrees. It's been great. Well, thank you for being so nice about it. It's cool. Thanks. Oh, it's, you know, it's great. We, we do learn a lot from you. I, at least I do. Um, and as a director, I'm sure sometimes it's so overwhelming to have to deal with every aspect of filmmaking. Like, I always get overwhelmed when I'm directing. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many aspects to it, and you're in charge of everything. How do you deal with with something like that, and do you actually, um, you know, share it with your actors or a producer, or do you just tell your wife, like, oh my yeah. God, it's such an awful um, day. You don't share it with anyone involved in the film, <laughs> um, <laughs> because you have to actually be, be seen as being so uh, calm the, and mm -hmm. the leader, the grown-up, you know, when and every, in the in the playground or you know or the insane asylum, depending on what it is. You have to actually be the which is tough because you're you really at least Don Mike is I most often if you I can on the set okay good let's try it again yeah that's good let's try inside are cartoon characters running around hitting bells and <laughs> pulling on alarms and trying to put out fires and and you know getting the suicide machinery going you know because it just seems like you're not going to survive it really feels like it's going to kill you, especially in prep. For me, I, once I'm shooting, I actually do calm down a little bit. But in prep, it just doesn't seem possible ever. I mean, it gets worse, too, because the expectations get higher. You think it's going to get easier. 
in prep, I'm usually a uh, basket case. And I, I talked to my wife about it, and she's, she's pretty cool uh, at, at um, keeping me calm. Um, I've, I'm trying to think of if I've, uh, what's the worst I've ever revealed. I mean, when I got sick on Meet the Fockers was crazy because I, I started, I was shooting a big scene with all the actors, and at 3 o'clock I noticed my ankles were swelling up, and by 8 o'clock, I couldn't move. I couldn't, my, all my joints were like, you have the mumps in every joint. And I was, the, the, the line producer took me to the hospital. De Niro knew these people at UCLA, so they were like shoving gunshot wound victims out of the way, pregnant ladies out of the way. <laughs> Get this guy in there, you know, they were dragging me right into it. But, because they were, they were afraid their movie was good, and it cost them half a million dollars to, I was so stressed out and so not sleeping. So it's not, it, you know, you can hide it, but it get, it's gonna get it's gonna get you. Comedy is so hard, and it's so much harder doing these HBO movies. You'd think the Sarah Palin movie would be scary. That was yes. like, that was so much fun. It was like, because you don't, you're not worrying every second. Is this funny enough? Because there's nothing more painful than bombing, you know, and putting up some scene in a preview and thinking it's gonna be the ending. Finally, we've got the ending. Oh, thank God, people looking at it going. I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's funny. <laughs> what? We just spent, you know, a week reshooting that ending. You don't like it? Yeah, I, I don't know. I just thought it was kind of cheesy. And <laughs> seen, I've seen it so many times. And why is why is Mike Myers staring at the camera? I don't get it. Like, you're just going, ah. Cartoon yeah. characters running around again. So it, it's not, uh, there's nothing you can do except just prepare Maybe don't do comedy, <laughs> um, and know your know your know what you care about. Know what matters so much that all you can do is the best you can do, and show up ready to fight for that, and per be persuasive, and throw every ounce of your your energy and your charm and your you know your willingness to put yourself out and not be embarrassed and not have any ego. And you have to have a tolerance for. Failure that is so high because you know, mo I always say on in dailies on Meet the Parents, everything we shot was terrible. It was terrible. It was like, what is De Niro doing? Why does he he would sometimes start mugging because the crew was laughing because he would he would think that they because they were la laughing, yeah. and I would be going, what is going on? And you you know you get in the cutting room and you cut out the one percent. You put in the one or a point. 0.5% that's great. And it's amazing. With, with De Niro, it's amazing. You know, it's not just all right. that 99.5% <laughs> that sucked. No one's ever going to see that. So you were thinking about all that the whole time when right. you were, you know, trying to figure out which vein you would open first at the, <laughs> the monitors. That's, you don't have to, it's going to be okay if you just get that 0.5% of that day's shoot, you know, you can make a great movie out of it. So you just have to be kind of stupidly optimistic and delusional <laughs> during the process and then and still fight for what you care about. And that's all you can do. You can't you just have to trick yourself into thinking it's going to be all right and, and fight for what you what matters in the scene. And, you know, sometimes it works. Look, sometimes it doesn't. I've definitely had some stuff that didn't work, you know, and <laughs> that keeps me up. But... It works eventually. Cool. Well, thank uh, you so much. I really appreciate sure. it. Sure. I remember after Big, I was spending time <laughs> with. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is good. Huh? What they're saying they're is saying don't cut your veins. That's yeah. basically what they're saying. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, well, thanks a lot, you guys. And, you know, I really appreciate the, the encouragement. It really actually does. Even now, I'm just sitting here going, I hope they're laughing at this. <laughs> and, and I'm also, you know, like a producer going, wow, it's really warm in here. Comedy, Mike Myers, I hear in his head, comedy hates warm rooms. Make sure the air conditioning is. So, um, got to watch it. Yeah, what yeah. happened? Today was really, yeah. there was no air conditioning. What happened, Anthony? Oh, it's cool. I'm not complaining. It's totally fine. No, I'm no, just, no. I, I, I saying, felt that they, it was they, hot, too. Would they laugh harder if it wasn't, yeah. if it was cooler? Yeah, I thought it was hot. <laughs> hey, what about the Lance, last uh, thing? What sure. about that Lance Armstrong movie? Yeah, we, um, you know, it's been announced. There's a competing one. J.J. Abrams has yeah. one, too, I guess. But he's going to, he's got Star Wars. He's hopefully very busy. <laughs> um, and, but we're, uh, 
We have uh, an interesting version of the story told from kind of from the point of view of uh, one of the other. They have the rights to Tyler Hamilton. Uh. Um, so it's kind of, it's it's not as it's a pretty unpredictable kind of interesting version of that That's story. That's what I was going to ask you. What interests yeah. you in that story? Cause it, it's it mostly just because it's um, I'm fascinated by people who get lost in a, a kind of um, state of mind that would propel you to. Yes. I mean, I don't know. He's a fascinating guy for for him to not only have gone through what he went through and do that stuff. You know, he gets, has cancer, comes, he does all, he wins all his races, but then also was so intense about uh, attacking people who dared right. question whether he was. Right. That's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> like, how does, how do you get to that place where you you could be that, um, uh -huh. you know, that passionate to, in, in a direction that's that sort of destructive and sort of undoes the sport you care about, you know, it's really an interesting psychological study in my opinion. So um, and that's, we're coming at it from a psychological standpoint. And okay. so Terrific. we'll see. Maybe it'll be as long good. as it's not a comedy, you shouldn't worry. Yeah, about it'll be fun. Opinion. It'll be easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so thank you, much thank for you. coming Thanks here. Thanks a lot. Thank and you. I'm sweating like a pig.